And I'm back. <laughs> Sorry. Wasn't really prepared for that today. Uh, but I'll be ready tomorrow. So, um, well, welcome this weekend. Who's excited to be here? I'm, ex- I'm excited to be here uh, this weekend. Robbie is actually on a mission trip to Mexico. So he's going to be in Mexico for the next week. So um, you get to hear me talk tonight or suffer through me speaking tonight. And then next weekend, you get to hear Jason. Uh, Jason Laird will be bringing the word next weekend. It's going to be awesome. So we're excited about that. Um, If you are visiting with us, we're happy that you're here with us tonight. We're excited you're here. Guys, can we give our visitors a round of applause? We're so excited that you guys are here with us tonight. Um, if If this is your first time with us, if you open up your What's Happening, you'll find a connection card in there. We encourage our members and our visitors to fill out those connection cards because those let us know what your prayer needs might be. Um, If you have an updated address, whatever the need may be, that lets us as a pastoral staff know what those needs are. And so we'd love for you to fill that out. We'll send you a gift card in the mail if you're a visitor with us. Um, So fill those out and drop them off in the offering box on your way out. We'd love for you guys to do that. Well, we're in the the fourth week of the My uh, My Message series, and this is a series centered on the life of David. And so uh, the past couple weeks, we've looked at the life of David. Uh, A couple weeks ago, uh, Robbie looked at uh, the mess that was created by King Saul and how David responded to that mess. And if you guys remember, David had a chance uh, to kill Saul, but instead left that in God's hands. And so uh, what Robbie talked to us about that week, the the message that we learned that week was that um, God's way is better and that we shouldn't be bitter. We shouldn't be bitter, but God's way is better. And Robbie reminded us last week as we looked at the story of David and Bathsheba that God loves us too much to leave us where we are. He loves us too much to leave us where we are in our sin. He loves us too much to leave us in our hurt and in our pain. He desires so much more for us. And sometimes uh, that means that there's going to be a mess in our lives. Um, Sin is very messy. And it takes a lot of mess sometimes in our lives to get our attention, doesn't it? Uh, But thank God for his grace and his mercy, for meeting us right where we're at, even when we've been involved in incredible sin in our lives. He meets us right where we're at, in the middle of our mess. He reaches down into the muck and the mire, and he provides a way out for us. That was the message last week. God loves us too much to leave us where we are. So before we dive into the text this week, before we dive into the message this week, I'd like to pray together. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for tonight, and uh, we pray that you would be with us as we dig into your word together and look at, uh, again, the life of David and uh, the various messes that existed in his life. I pray that you would speak to us as we look tonight at the uh, the mess that Absalom caused for David, his own son. Um, I pray that you would move me out of the way and that I would be a mouthpiece for you tonight, that you would speak through me and uh, that you would calm my nerves uh, as I stand here. I am nervous, and so I pray that you would just remove that from me in this moment. I pray that you would uh, begin readying people's hearts to hear the message today, even my own heart, I pray that you would begin working on my heart as well so, so that I might be preaching not, not outwardly, but to all of us, to myself and to everyone else here. I pray that the message would hit us all right where we need to be hit tonight. I pray that you would speak to us tonight. I pray that your spirit would be heavy in this place, that you would convict hearts, that you would change lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to tell a story real quick. But before I tell the story, I want to start with a statement. And the statement is this. The messes caused by those we love are the ones that hurt the most. The messes caused by those we love are the ones that hurt the most. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Brandon Moore. I'm the Next Step Pastor here at Family Life. Um, 
But years ago, before I became a pastor, I was a youth pastor for three years before I was called to family life, and um, I really enjoyed that. But before, even before that, I was in graduate school, and before that, um, I went to undergrad at Abilene Christian University, and for as long as I could remember growing up, I wanted to be a doctor, because my dad's an optometrist, and my mom's a dental hygienist, and so I just, I wanted to be a doctor, at least that's what I thought. But the closer I got to graduation at ACU, the more I started to realize I just wasn't super passionate about medicine. So I worked uh, at BSA. I was a surgical transporter for a while in the summers and then also at Christmas. And um, I enjoyed it. It was okay. It was good. But it, wasn't, it just wasn't something I was super passionate about. And, and, and what's crazy is that's... <laughs> I realized that long before I actually was willing to admit it, years before I was willing to admit it. <clears throat> and so when I, when I graduated from undergrad at ACU, I had a degree in history, and, <laughs> and if any of you in here have a degree in history, you know it's a pretty useless degree. <laughs> so um, you can teach, then that's great if you wanna teach, but other than that, or you can be a museum curator, which is fun, I guess. Um, so anyway, I, I felt kind of stuck. Uh, I had a degree in history, and when I, when I came back to Amarillo, I, I did a little bit of investigation, and I discovered that uh, if you wanted to teach history in our school system, you also have to coach. <laughs> well, I'm not a coach, so um, that was disappointing to me, because I was like, well, I spent four years getting this degree, and now it means nothing, because I can't coach, so anything. Uh, and so I, I went through a period of time where I was just incredibly depressed. Uh, this time period in my life lasted at least two, possibly three years. And during that time period, I mean, I, I was just lost, just lost. And I don't mean lost as in salvationally lost. I just mean I had no direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, I knew that I was, I got excited when I was involved in ministry, but I didn't, I didn't really think that was ever something that was gonna happen for me. And so for two to three years, I just wandered. I came back to Amarillo and I, and I lived with my parents and, and uh, that sounded like a good idea. <laughs> my mom's sitting right over there, so I gotta be careful what I say. <laughs> but that sounded like a good idea, but it turned out to maybe not be such a good idea. Um, I found myself staying out late and just wasting time. And, and then I, I was, a, I was a, a substitute teacher for a while. And as I was substitute teaching, you know, as substitute teachers, you have, to, you have to call into the system or the system calls you and then you decide whether you want to work that day and where. And so there were many days when I would wake up and I'd get a call and I just would decide, eh, I'm not going to work that day. So there was laziness and apathy that crept into my life as well, which quite honestly was sinful. It was just sinful because I was taking advantage of my parents. I was living with them. I wasn't working really very much. It was just, I was in a bad way. And so, <laughs> I had a conversation with my parents at one point in time uh, during this two-year period, two to three-year period, and I remember I was sitting in my parents' living room with them, and they were so upset with me. And my dad, in the middle of this conversation, um, gotta be careful where I look. Uh, <clears throat> my dad, in the middle of this conversation, um, he looks at me and he says, son, you're, you're screwing up your life. You're screwing up your life. He didn't say it in those words. He used different words, um, which for me was shocking because my dad has always, has always when, we were, when he was raising us, when my parents were raising us, he was always very gentle with his words, never, never used any words that were shocking, shall we say? So it was just, it was shocking to me. It was like, whoa, my dad's really upset because he just, he just cussed and he doesn't do that. So, and I'm not advocating curse words, although I am, I, I will say that there are times and places when they might be applicable and helpful. In that case, it was very helpful for me. I'm going to get in trouble for that one. <laughs> save your emails, save your emails. I don't want to, I don't want to get any... So in, in that case, at that point in time in my life, that was what I needed to hear. Let me just say it that way. That was what I needed to hear. 
And I realized, and it made me mad because I was like, who is he to tell me that? But I was lost and someone needed to grab me and shake me and say, wake up. You got to do something with your life. You're far too valuable to waste your life. <clears throat> so sometimes the mess of a person's life overflows into the life of someone who loves them. The mess of my life overflowed into the lives of my parents. My mistakes, my apathy, my sin was starting to affect them. But the primary reason that my parents were upset at my mess was not because it affected them. It wasn't because it affected them. It was because they wanted so much more from me because they loved me. Me coming in late at night, it might have been an imposition a little bit here or there, but it wasn't, that wasn't what was affecting them. That wasn't what they were concerned about. They loved me. They wanted more from me than that. They saw that I was hurting, that I was lost, and they saw the effect that those things were having on me, and they knew that I could be so much more, that God had so much more in store for me than what I was currently experiencing. And I'm not a parent, and so I don't fully understand how it feels to have a child, to love them and want, to, want what's best for them, to be brokenhearted when they're lost, to watch them make mistakes. I don't know what that feels like, but I know what it feels like to be the child of a parent who loves me deeply, parents who love me deeply. That I know. And I've watched friends of mine make decisions that at least for a time completely ruined their lives, decisions that left them in a very, very dark place for years. And I don't have biological children, but I was a youth pastor for three years. And through that experience, I learned, at least in part, what it means to see the absolute mess that exists in some students' lives and to want more for them, to ache for more for them. You want to see them succeed. You want to see them experience life to the fullest. You want them to know Jesus. So I'm telling you again, the messes caused by those we love are the ones that hurt the most. I may not have children, but I understand what it means to hurt for someone else, to wish for something better for them. And I would venture to guess that most of the people in this room have had that same experience when they look back on their lives. You look back and you see the absolute mess that someone in your life, whether that's a friend or a family member or a child, has caused, and you feel for them. You hurt for them. And it's not primarily because that mess overflows into your life and affects your life. It's because you want more for them, because you love them. You want so much more for them. And as we look at today's text, I think we're going to see that David experienced that himself, because David had children too. And today we're going to focus on the life of Absalom, David's third son. This guy caused such a mess in his own life and in the life of his father that it threatened to destroy the very kingdom that David had sought to build. So we're going to look at Absalom's mess today, overflowing into the life of David's. If you know anything about Absalom, you know that eventually he became one of the greatest enemies that David ever had. His own son became one of the greatest enemies that he ever had. But he didn't start out viewing David as his enemy. In fact, as we'll start to see as we examine the life of Absalom, there are a few people on earth who have been set up for success the way that Absalom was. He almost ended up destroying the entire kingdom of Israel, but at the beginning, he was set up. He had everything. Robbie stated last week, when we open the door, sin comes in as a guest, but soon it becomes our master. True words. Those are true words. We open the door to sin and it comes in as a guest, but soon it becomes our master. And Absalom, through a series of bad decisions in his life, allows sin to become his master. So who was Absalom? Well, Absalom was the third son of King David. Makkah and David were his parents. His mother was also the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. So Absalom was the son of two royal lines. He was royal blood through and through. 
He's also described as the most handsome man in the kingdom. Let me read this to you guys from 2 Samuel 14, 25. This is what what 2 Samuel says about Absalom. In all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. Whenever he cut the hair of his head, he used to cut his hair once a year because it became too heavy for him. He would weigh it, and its weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard. So, He had a full head of hair, which some of us are lacking, I'm sure. Some of us are moving that direction. (laughs) So he was a a handsome man. Not only was he royal, but he was attractive. His father was King David. I mean, this guy had it all. He had a sister named Tamar, who was also incredibly beautiful. See, this is where problems begin to creep in for Absalom because Absalom's older brother, Amnon, who was his half-brother, actually. It wasn't his full brother, but he was his half-brother, Amnon, uh, fell in love with his half-sister, Tamar. And Amnon was the second in line to take the place of David, so he was the next in line as king. And in one of the darkest sections of scripture that you will ever read, in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, Amnon, the second-born son of David, ends up sleeping with his half-sister Tamar against her will. Now, Tamar was Absalom's full-blooded sister. And from that moment onward, scripture tells us that Absalom hated Amnon, hated him. Absalom hated his brother Amnon because of what Amnon had done to Tamar. And if you want to read that, that's in 2 Samuel 13, 21 through 22. Absalom's hatred of his brother caused him ultimately to take his brother's own life. To take his brother's life. He hated him enough to kill him. We read in 2 Samuel 13, verses 23 through 33, that Absalom was able to bide his time over the course of about two years. And then he tricks his father, King David, into allowing Amnon to attend a feast. And when Amnon is at the feast, they wait until he gets drunk, and then Absalom has his friends murder Amnon. Absalom may have had a good reason for hating Amnon. Who wouldn't be upset in light of what Amnon had done to Tamar? But Scripture is clear. In Deuteronomy 32, 35, we learn that vengeance is the Lord's, This was a hard message for Absalom to know or to accept. He wanted justice for his sister. He wanted justice for her. And David, because of his love for his sons, didn't punish Amnon for what he had done. So their hatred begins to be focused not only at Amnon, but also at David, because David refused to do anything about it. So we see from Scripture just what we learned from the story of David and Bathsheba last week. We see sin slowly creeping its way into Absalom's life. And it's how it always starts, right? Slowly creeping its way in. He's rightfully angry about the violation of his sister Tamar, but rather than leaving vengeance to God, he allows hatred to fill his heart and seeks vengeance for his sister. And this episode ends with Amnon dead and Absalom fleeing to Geshur, the kingdom of his grandfather. So he he runs away from David. So he murdered his brother Amnon because of the hatred that he had for him. And then he conspires to take his father's kingdom from him. So after living apart from David for three years in his grandfather's kingdom of Geshur, Absalom is allowed to return to to Jerusalem, and after another two years living there, he's finally allowed to go in and see his father. And so we think that there's reconciliation there because he comes in and David kisses him, and everything looks like it might be okay. But then soon after, Absalom conspires to take David's kingdom from him. According to 2 Samuel 15, 1 through 6, Absalom would meet people at the gate of the city and tell people who came to complain to the king that he would hear their complaints. 
This is Absalom doing this. And so Absalom had a chariot. He had 50, 50 bodyguards that followed him around. So he looked very majestic on his high chariot. And he would meet people at the gates and tell them that he wished that he could hear their complaints. Because if he were appointed the judge over the land, he would give them justice. So he was pushing people within David's own kingdom to question whether or not he was a just king. Basically, he was saying to them, if I were the judge, if I were the king, I would give you justice. So throughout a four-year period, Absalom built support for himself, and eventually he makes his move. He lies to his father, goes with a group of his supporters to Hebron, the former capital of the nation of Israel, and declares himself the king of Israel, reigning from Hebron. In in response to that massive outpouring of support that Absalom has gained over the course of four years, David is forced to flee from Jerusalem. So there's so much support for Absalom that David has to flee Jerusalem. He has to run away. So not only does Absalom hatefully murder his brother, he also conspires to and actually succeeds in forcing David to flee from Jerusalem. So he's got him on the run. And at one point, he's poised to take the entire kingdom from his father. And if this weren't enough, Absalom continues in this downward spiral. It gets worse. It gets way worse. Let me read 2 Samuel 16, 15 through 17, 23 for you. Meanwhile, Absalom... And all the men of Israel came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with him. Then Hushai, the archite, David's confidant, went to Absalom and said to him, Long live the king, long live the king. Absalom said to Hushai, So this is the love you show your friend? If he's your friend, why didn't you go with him? Hushai says to Abs- or said to Absalom, No, the one chosen by the Lord, by these people, and by all the men of Israel, his I will be, and I will remain with him. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve the son just as I served your father? So I will serve you. Absalom said to Ahithophel, give us your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel answered, sleep with your father's concubines whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself obnoxious to your father and the hands of everyone with you will be more resolute. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days, the advice Ahithophel gave was like that of one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose 12,000 men and set out tonight in pursuit of David. I would attack him while he is weary and weak. I would strike him with terror and then all the people with him will flee. I would strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. The death of the man you seek will mean the return of all. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Absalom and to all the elders of Israel. So it gets way worse. This, along with almost everything else that we've talked about in the story of Absalom, is just awful. It's one of the saddest and darkest sections of Scripture that you're likely to come across. Absalom and his followers pitch a tent on the roof of the palace, and Absalom sleeps with the concubines of David in the view of all Israel. In the ancient world, and in today's world for that matter, this would have been about as despicable of an act that you could commit. So Ahithophel, which, by the way, Ahithophel is actually Bathsheba's grandfather, which kind of gives you some background on him about why he might have suggested this to Absalom and why he might have suggested that Absalom go after David and kill him. He's the one who suggests that Absalom do all this. And then Ahithophel also suggests that they pursue David and kill him. And Absalom agrees He agrees, which is just crazy because he's got Jerusalem. He he has the capital. He has everything. He's got major support from the nation of Israel in its entirety, and he's still not satisfied. He wants to kill his own father. He's disrespected and disgraced himself in the sight of all Israel, 
and he's willing to kill even his own father. So he's burned all the bridges and there's no going back. We're not going to read this, but soon after this, there is a big battle between David's forces and Absalom's forces. Under Joab's command, David's forces are able to defeat Absalom's forces. And in the course of the battle, Absalom, riding on a donkey, passes underneath a tree and ends up getting his hair caught in the tree. And so he's hanging there with his, his body hanging in the air, and, and Joab and a group of his men come over and knock him out of the tree and then kill him. But before the battle, David asked that the men deal gently with Absalom, which is just crazy to me, deal gently with Absalom. But in spite of David's plea, Absalom is killed, which brings us to 2 Samuel 18, 24 through 33. And this is where I really want you guys to hear this. This is, this is where I want to hang out for a little bit. This is 2 Samuel 18, 24 through 33. While David was sitting between the inner and outer gates, the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall. As he looked out, he saw a man running alone. The watchman called out to the king and reported it. The king said, if he is alone, he must have good news. And the runner came closer and closer. When the watchman saw another runner, he looked down to the gatekeeper. Look, another man running alone. The king said, he must be bringing good news too. The watchman said, it seems to me that the first one runs like Ahimaaz, son of Zadok. He's a good man, the king said. He comes with good news. Then Ahimez called out to the king, all is well. He bowed down before the king with his face to the ground and said, praise be to the Lord your God. He has delivered up those who lifted their hands against my Lord the king. The king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimez answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I don't know what it was. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. Then the Cushite arrived and said, my Lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, may the enemies of, the, of my Lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. And this is verse 33 might be one of the most moving sections in the entire Bible. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. So David receives news of the death of his son Absalom, and how does he react? Not with rejoicing, that's what the runners were expecting, not with praise for the ones who brought the news, but with mourning. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, would I had died instead of you, my son. Now, there have been many attempts to interpret his grief here, but this much is clear. David loved Absalom. He loved him with that fierce and generous love that parents have for their children. An unconditional love. Love that says, it doesn't matter what you do, I'm still going to love you. It doesn't make any sense. But David was unable to save Absalom from the consequences of his rebellion. Joab, David's commander, saw that justice was done. But David had experienced God's grace when he behaved at least as wickedly as Absalom. Because we just saw last week how David saw Bathsheba and he, had, he was in an adulterous relationship with her and then he had her husband killed. And he receives grace because of his repentance. Repentance. And when it comes to his son Absalom, David wishes with all of his heart that he could have taken his son's place, that he could die for him. I think that this points us to something incredibly important, biblically speaking. This episode in the Bible, the mess that Absalom caused in David's life, 
the unbelievable pain and suffering that he caused for his father, the huge mess that he made. And David's love for his son, despite his son's failings and rebellion, it points us to Jesus. It points us to the need for the cross. David was ready to die for a rebellious son. And it's funny because his words, would that I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, they're almost prophetic. Because Jesus was willing to die for a rebellious race. Let me read this to you guys. This is from John Woodhouse. He says this, this episode in the history of David's kingdom is a powerful display of the problem that David's kingdom could not resolve. The king himself was a sinner, as were his sons and his subjects. In particular, Absalom was a rebel. Justice demanded one thing, and David probably knew this. Justice demanded Absalom's death. He had sinned grievously, not only against his brother, who he murdered, and his father, whose rule he overthrew and who he tried to kill, but he stood against everything that the nation of Israel was supposed to be. But through it all, David, in his love for Absalom, longed for something else. Remarkably, David's helpless cry anticipated the solution that would one day be provided. Would I had died instead of you, David wept. I don't imagine that David was conscious of the significance of these words. They're almost prophetic words. Because when the great son of David eventually came, namely Jesus, he came to die instead of his enemies. A ransom instead of many. As Matthew 20, 28 says. So this points us to the need for the cross, to the need for Christ. Let me read this to you. This is from Romans 6, or Romans, Romans 5, excuse me, 6 through 11. It says this. You see, at, the, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. David's longing to die for his son in place of his son, anticipates Christ dying for us, for our sin. It's a foreshadowing of the son of David who came and took our sin upon himself and makes us right with God. Don't miss that in this story. There are a number of, of lessons that I think we could pull out of this dark section of scripture, not the least of which is the dangerous and progressive effects of sin on the lives of human beings are controlled by it. Absalom went from bad to worse, did he not? And even worse. And he ended up being remembered by the people of Israel as one of the worst characters in their history. It doesn't get much worse than Absalom. Yes, sin is dangerous. And as Rabbi, Rabbi, <laughs> as Rabbi told us last week, when we open the door to it, uh, sin will become our master. It certainly mastered Absalom. It mastered him. You look at Absalom, at, at Absalom at the end of his life and you wonder, is this guy even human anymore? Because sin has so ravaged his heart and so it's just destroyed him. He hates even his own father. But what I'd like for us to really zero, on, zero in on, on the life of David this week is not the ravaging effects of sin, although I think that that is a lesson that you could pull out of it. But it's this. Those who know grace show grace. Those who know grace show grace. David had every reason imaginable to despise his son. His son had murdered his brother. 
His son had conspired against him to take the kingdom. His son had mustered an army to come and kill him. Absalom had done horrible things. But David, despite all of this, still loved Absalom. Not only did he love him, he wanted Absalom to live. Absalom deserved death, but David wished that there was some way he could live, even if it meant that he himself should die. Why was this the case? Why? Why on earth would David feel that way? I think that David wanted grace for Absalom because that's exactly what David received from God. He received grace. In his adultery with Bathsheba, he received grace because of a repentant heart, and he wanted that desperately for his son. So he showed him grace. Instead of rejoicing over the fact that he was killed, he mourned. David deserved death, but he received grace. And we too, as those who don't deserve grace but receive it anyway, because of Jesus' death on the cross, we ought to show grace to those around us, even if they've hurt us. 1 John 4.19 says this, we love because he first loved us. If we've experienced the grace and love of Christ, if we believe in him as our Lord and Savior in his death on the cross for our sins, then we cannot withhold grace and forgiveness from those who wrong us. We can't. No matter, no matter how grievously they've wounded us, we can't hold grace back from them. And this is easier when it's our family, like David and Absalom. But this principle applies to everyone we come into contact with. Those who know grace show grace. We love because he first loved us. So I have two questions for you today. First, do you know grace? Have you experienced that grace and mercy that can only be found in Jesus? And the second question I have for you is this. If you've experienced this mercy and grace of God because of the death, death of Jesus on the cross for your sins, will you show that same grace and love to others? We show grace in your life. Are there relationships in your life that are broken because you yourself Refuse to give grace to that person. I think that everybody in this room can probably say that that's happened for them at one point in time in their life or another. And I'm encouraging you, if you know grace, show grace. Last week we talked about how, I think how grace affects us because of a repentant heart. And because of Jesus' death on the cross, we're made right with God. This week, we're talking about how it should affect our relationships with others. If we know grace, we show grace. Will you show grace in your life to those around you, whether they deserve it or not? It's my prayer that we as a church family, because of the great love and grace that we've known, will show grace even when it's hard. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word and how it speaks to us even through incredibly dark sections where it seems like there's not a whole lot we could pull out of it that's good. But your word is always good. Your word is always good. I pray that we would be focused on the gospel this week, on your grace that you've shown us. I pray that you would begin changing our hearts and our attitudes towards people who have wronged us in our lives, whoever that may be, whether that's a family member or a friend. I pray that we would show grace even to those we don't know. We love because you first loved us. I pray that that would be a heartbeat this week as we go out. It's in your name we pray.
Amen.